Well, welcome, all you wiretappers. Good to be back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. I have a man who is uh, probably one of the most respected mafia historians in the United States, Gus Russo. You probably have heard of his books, Super Mob. Welcome, Gus. I'm really glad hey, to have Gary. you here. Uh, Thanks for having me. Super nice Mob and all of a sudden, let's see, and The Outfit. <laughs> and do you have other books, Gus? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I've got about nine now. I think uh, oh, wow. I've done a couple. I've done a couple in the Kennedys, and I've got a really one that's been really successful called "Best of Enemies," an espionage book that's being made into a feature film. So, very excited oh, about that. I, I read something about that. I'd forgotten about that. Interesting. Well, what I'll do, guys, is is I'll have a link to his author's page on Amazon, so you can search among his books. And and he is probably, uh, like I said, one of the most respected mob historians in the United States today. Oh. Uh, along with Selwyn Rabb, probably he ranks right up there with Selwyn Rabb. And as far as Chicago is concerned, to me, he is the man for Chicago. And we all <laughs> love Chicago up there. And I have to thank, speaking of Chicago, I have to thank my friend, Chicago native Ben Ellickson, for sending me this book, The Outfit. He's been after me to do this for a while. And I don't know, some you get distracted by you know, the glitz and the glamour of New York sometimes. And I forget about my Chicago guys. I get back to them periodically. So he's been, thank you very much for sending me this book because I did some shorts out of the book, little one minute things for YouTube, just little quick little stories out of the book. And now we're going to do a full interview with Gus Russo. And Gus, I'll tell you what, the Chicago guys, I'll get I'll get an extra bump up in Chicago when that starts going around <laughs> up there. I've got an interview with them. I, I, I promise you that. They love you in Chicago. <laughs> But we're going to talk about Murray Humphreys, Murray the Camel Humphreys. And I've wanted to do this guy for a long time. He's an interesting guy. And one reason I feel a connection to him, because my family came over from Wales a lot longer before his family did. His mother and father came from Wales. Now, here's a Welshman who becomes a, a trusted, highly valued, maybe upper echelon, if you will, member of the Chicago outfit. And Gus just said, you know, he said, used to say, well, is this just organized crime or is this the mafia? You know, so they got, they got Jewish guys, they got the Welshman in there. And, and so it's, it's interesting. So Gus, let's start talking about Murray, the Camel Humphreys, I guess. Tell us a little bit about his early growing up years. I know you know something about that. Not, not a lot, but a little bit about him growing up. Yeah, well, he was born in Illinois and his parents were were lower rent. They, they, they were, you know, in poverty. And, you know, I think well, his name was, they called him Lou. You know, his name wasn't Murray. It was Lou Llewellyn. He took to the streets at a very young age doing just petty stuff, you know, whatever he could do to survive and got into a lot of trouble that way. I don't remember all the details at this point, but he was a hooligan to a degree, and he pretty much had to be. He was so poor, and he got into trouble with truancy and, and juvenile crime and went before judges. In fact, one judge took to him so well, and it was mutual, that Lou took his name from that judge, Murray, Judge Murray, whatever his name, whole name was, and so he became Murray Humphreys at that point and just kept moving up the ladder into bootlegging and whatever was going on at the time and uh, but yeah from a young guy he was on the streets surviving yeah everybody everybody was was poor and a street criminal during those yeah. years then prohibition came along now I, you mentioned that judge murray didn't he like try to get him to go into the law actually did, did i read that yeah well yeah I, as i as i recall I think, forgive me it's been you know 25 30 years since i, I delved deep into it but uh, yeah he he certainly he got Murray interested in law, and he tried to get him to think about becoming a lawyer because he, Murray was a brilliant kid. Right. That, that, Everybody who met him knew within a minute, this guy's got a high IQ. But he did inure in him a lifelong love of, of reading law books, that, interviewing his family and his ex-wife and everything. They said he read voraciously, but it was always like Martindale Hubble. It's all he read. He had some legal books behind him, and he devoured these things. Why he became so obsessed with the law is beyond me, but that was his thing. And but it it held him in good stead when he needed to know how to work. You know, to advise the gangsters on uh, getting out of trouble. And he he had so many great legal contraptions that he worked out for the mob that uh, he was called the Einstein, you know, of the mob. But okay. he yeah, he just loved law books. Uh, and yeah, thanks, I, I thanks really, to Judge Murray. 
I read something about how he kind of noticed that double jeopardy thing early on, and they didn't really think about that back to, back in those old days of double jeopardy, and and how he moved Jake Guzek's body from because he knows that it's going to expose people who hung out or went to this restaurant, and he moved his body. So this guy was always thinking, wasn't he? he was well, yeah, he he right. was he was the one who came up with using the Fifth Amendment before Congress. Ah. you know, up until that point. You could use the fifth in a courtroom, but his research, when they got called before, I guess the, it was either Key Fava or one of the investigations before that, and he told these guys, just read these little cue cards I'm going to give you, these little index cards, uh, and take the Fifth Amendment. And the uh, people, the congressmen on, on the dais, they said, you can't do that. And, the, and Curly said, I think we can. You're going to find out we can. <laughs> they, they did their research. They found out Curly was for Right. But they were so stymied. They had they never expected a, a criminal to plead the fifth in Congress. <laughs> and the score just went up a notch with the mob after that. <laughs> really? Oh, man, I bet. You know, you mentioned prohibition. And of course, as I started to say, all these guys, once prohibition hit, then that's, you know, that became full employment for young gangsters <laughs> in yeah. the 20s. And so then I suppose is that when he first met, got in with Capone and, and the outfit? Yeah, you know, keep in, I'll get to that. But you know, keep in mind, prohibition was one of the great ironies of all time because, you know, when the temperance societies started to push for prohibition, their thinking was it would clean up crime. <laughs> and it had just the complete opposite effect. It made all these street hooligans millionaires. Yeah. It, and uh, it organized about, it. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, after, after a prohibition came in, these guys were... They had these great networks of contacts and for distribution and everything. And they said, what do we do with this world that we've developed here? We can't do booze anymore, but we have yeah. all this great interstate network of, of distribution. And that's when people like Humphreys came up with a lot of ideas for how to you know, keep moving with organized crime. Yeah, I was reading how he got into labor racketeering pretty early, too. Yeah, yeah. He, he realized, yeah, that I don't, you know, I doubt he invented it, but he certainly perfected it. The idea of uh, the sweetheart deals where he would re go to the uh, corporate heads and say, I will keep the unions in, in check for you so they won't strike or ask for rate incre or wage increases. And then he went to the unions and, and said, if you let us take care of you, you know, we'll represent you and get you wage increases. So he was lying to every, he was lying to them, to the mm -hmm. workers. And uh, he was paid by the owners and of you know, the companies or the mob was, but that was his strategy to play them off against each other. And, uh, and it worked for a long time, you know. You know, and I can't remember, I looked into that Hollywood extortion and that had a lot to do with labor unions out in Hollywood, but I don't remember his name being involved in that. Was he involved in that in any manner? Oh, he was really involved. And he was also very much involved in springing those guys when they got busted in the 40s for it. He was all over that thing. What happened was Humphreys, as I recall, and you can fact check me on this, but he in the early 30s, the Chicago mob took over IATSE, the Team Hands Union, mm -hmm. the theatrical and stage hands union, and uh, which ran all the movie theaters or the unionized movie theaters. And that was their entrance into entertainment. And I think that came because of Murray. That was his idea. When they went down, they went down to a the convention of IATSE in the early 30s down in Kentucky and basically took over the convention they walked in there literally with machine guns you know right. and said our, our guy is going to be the president of IATSE from now on and that's how they put George Brown in and that was I think Murray orchestrated that and but it, it was brilliant because then they were able to, to take over movie theater chains across the country and charge what they wanted to the distributors blah 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 to the movie studios and that got them ultimately into Hollywood because IATSE that union is very, very strong in Hollywood and you can't do business to this day, really, without getting IATSE to cooperate. So if they, Murray realized that if they ran in that union, they could control the entertainment business from the bottom instead of from the top. Really? And that was his genius, you know, that, that the, the bottom could run everything. So, and, and then the heads of the studios, they started shaking them down uh, as individuals, because that's kind of how it fell, if I remember right, that one of the studio heads, when Robert Montgomery, I think, a pretty well-known, mm -hmm. powerful mm -hmm. actor at the time, yeah. 
started blowing the whistle on her, but they really started shaking down these individual, you know, like Robert, you know, Zanuck and, and I don't remember the names, but a lot of famous names they had to. Oh yeah. Well, that was it. It was, it was again, another double cross, like the, the sweetheart deals. What happened was the idea came about because I think Johnny Roselli had, had, who was running MCA at the time, uh, Stein, Joel Stein, who was from Chicago and he was uh -huh. an associate of Capone. He ended up forming MCA, a big studio or a big agency in Hollywood. So he brought Johnny Roselli out oh, yeah. to, con to control the, the, to bust the unions and, and you know, to, to, to get rough with everybody. And Johnny comes back to Chicago and says, Hey guys, you know, we can make some money in Hollywood. This thing is, this business is growing. So what they did was where the Hollywood moguls brought the mob out to control the unions. Yeah. The, the, again, the, this, the mob said, hmm, we can work that the other way, just like we did here in <laughs> Chicago. And we'll take, well, yeah, we'll take over the unions for you, but then we're going to run you. And, and then you're going to, we're going to bribe you, blackmail you. So it, another thing like prohibition that backfired. And so Murray was sort of in charge, as far as I can remember, of getting that whole thing going, of taking over that critical, this critical unions, including the Teamsters years later. Yeah, I'll be darned. Well, that's uh, he was such a powerful guy that is really not that well known. Uh, think about yeah. it. I mean, compared to Giancana and you know Anthony Accardo and Johnny Roselli, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, he really knew how to stay in the background. So um, that whole, I, I'm glad you mentioned that whole getting the was it seven Chicago outfit mobsters were all in Leavenworth. They first put them in different prisons at, at right. Whatever convicted of the Hollywood extortion, racket, right? union racketeering, and then all at one time during the war, they all ended up in Leavenworth, I believe, and then they pulled some strings. They had 10-year sentences, and they were supposed to do about nine years of that 10 years, and, and they got out early, and it was a huge scandal at the time. So he had Yeah, the, yeah, the Hollywood that. scandal, yeah. Well, what happened was Murray and Sidney Korshak, who was his, sort of his protege in this labor racketeering thing, he, he sort of groomed Korshak. They had tr President Truman sort of under their thumb in a way because he was the protege of Tom Pendergast, you know, the the, the, the mob boss from Kansas, and who, cr you know, pretty much created Truman. And so they basically went through Pendergast. This was the genius again. How do we get our guys out? Hmm, well, let's see, Tom Pendergast. And we'll just lower the, the boom on Truman and say, unless you get our guys transferred to a better prison and then an early parole will put everything we know about you and uh, your connections in Kansas out there. And that's how they got the guys out early. Yeah. I read about that. And, and his uh, attorney general was a man named Tom Clark. Yes. Kind of an old school politician. And he's the one that really was Truman's, you know, his uh, go-to to get all this handled. He had to have the attorney general on board, of course, and, and yeah. do something like this. And then Tom Clark gets rewarded. He, he becomes appointed. <laughs> he gets appointed to the Supreme Court after oh, yeah. this is over. So, I mean, man. It, it, it's crazy. It's just crazy. I uh, know. But uh, that, that's what I was so intrigued about these guys for, because they were, were, weren't were famous, like all this New York stuff that you always, everybody knows Luciano and Gambino yeah. and all that stuff. But these guys were great because they weren't famous to the average person, and yet they were in many ways more powerful than what was going on in New York. You know, New York was, to me, uh, a fiefdom to itself, but Chicago was running a big hunk of the country. Yeah, they were. You know, and they, they, they loved was. the fact that the New Yorkers were getting all the headlines. That was another thing, is they knew the, the efficacy of staying low profile, whereas oh, yeah. in New York, you know, all the way up to Gotti, you know, everybody wants to be on the front page, and not all of right. them. But a lot of them did enough that it drew a lot of attention, and boy, the Chicago guys were smart. This now we're up to about World War II, the end of the war. This is kind of his big thing, and is what what does he do then after the war? I, you know, I, well, let, let's tell one story about the moving of the body of Greasy Thumb Guzik. Do you remember that at all? No, then, yeah, you'll have to refresh that. me. I apologize. Uh, I don't know if I had that in the book. Did I have that in the book, or did I know it, that? It, well, maybe not. Maybe I got that. <laughs> I just kind of struck me. He was uh, Guzik died. In a public place, it was a place where a lot of politicians had come to, and I can't remember the name of it. Oh well, it's not not important, guys. But just the, you know, the thumbnail sketch of the story for you guys out there. He, he died in this public place where a lot of politicians, like Counselor's Row Restaurant, maybe down right. by uh, downtown Chicago, some place like that, 
And since he died there, he was so such a lightning rod. He kind of had, he, he had uh, become a lightning rod with the Chicago public and the Tribune and all those reporters up there that, that he moved his body and took it back over to his home so they could claim he died in his home rather than in this restaurant oh, or whatever. That's was. great. <laughs> the guy was always thinking. I mean, he was always thinking. What about the, there was a, a deal of the fake kidnapping of this con artist back in the 30s, John Factor, Jake the Barber. He oh yeah well you know they or something and then they fake the kidnapping and yeah uh a lot of that was to get even with john tui who had double crossed the guys back in the in the 30s and uh, so it was a very elaborate scheme where they pretended that jake the barber had had been kidnapped and he was an associate of the outfit of course and and they pinned it on tui and Tui ends up going to prison for <laughs> 30 years or something for, you know, for something he didn't even do. And then when he came out of prison in the late 50s, he wrote a book about it. And of course, they killed him instantly <laughs> after he wrote the book. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was another elaborate scheme where to get a guy, you know, who I guess Jake the Barber might not have been a naturalized citizen. And they had to skirt all that issue as well. And yeah, so they had English. to come up with this elaborate thing to keep him you know around and they they framed this innocent guy john yeah, he, yeah. He, he was english and they were looking to deport him and that's so, right and then they faked the kidnapping and it just got such a uh, an elaborate cool scheme that helped this guy out and took care of some competition and you know no 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 deaths no bodies <laughs> no, oh, no headlines <laughs> the schemes were just non-stop it was just one after another they were they were all elaborate and well thought out and that's what's so intriguing about them it wasn't all like shoot 'em up stuff it, it would very often it was just some crazy scheme like when they blackmailed estes kefauver which you may want to get to but yeah um, oh yeah let's tell us tell us you know about that tell us about that i, I know they did he, he's yeah well, girls. well you know <laughs> In the early 50s, when Kefauver, which I think to this day is still the only congressional hearing about organized crime or yeah. congressional investigation, and it was a big deal, and obviously it went on for a couple of years, and they had zeroed in on Chicago, and they especially had zeroed in on Sidney Korshak. They really, he was at the top of their list. They wanted him because that got them to Murray Humphreys, of course, and the whole big labor, interstate labor control that they had, and Keith Farber was really interested in this. Uh, and of course, Humphreys and the and Korshak and the mob couldn't allow that to be successful. This was billions of dollars when you yeah. gross, when you think of all the business they were doing across the country. So uh, they knew they did a little investigation and knew, they knew Keith Farber had a weakness, <laughs> a very common weakness, shall we yeah. say. And so, <laughs> I know a lot of guys who got that weakness. I had a little no bit myself when I was young. <laughs> yeah, no comment. It's funny because I think. I think Keith Barber was a very like a quote unquote Christian kind yeah. of guy. You know, he presented himself like a lot of politicians do as being born again and all that stuff, which was pretty phony. And <laughs> and, and and so Korshak set him up with uh, a couple, you know, la uh, working ladies at the uh, Drake <laughs> Hotel, which they had put cameras all set up. And uh, Korshak showed up in, in Keith Barber's office one day and put the photos on the desk and said, okay, how far do you want to go with this? And that was the end of it. <laughs> And I don't think court, I don't think Keith Hover, for all the money, all the money spent and all the hearings, I don't think they had one success. I mean, it was nothing happened. And, and so, yeah, that was much ado about nothing. I have to say, I have to brag a little bit. When I was writing the outfit in the late 90s, I realized that the, the Keith Hover papers were still stored and locked away. And so I there's a 50 year rule or there was at the time. It might be 75 now, but it was a 50 year rule on automatically on congressional documents and the 50-year rule was almost up but it wasn't so i got in touch with some congressmen in fact i think uh, it was senator uh, mccain his office was in charge of, of the library of congress holdings or whatever through his committee and mccain uh, went to bat for me and he said i'll open them up it's only a couple years away anyway so i i was the first person to open like 40 or 50 boxes of keith Faber stuff and that was an uh, interesting day, you know, <laughs> to yeah. pry those yeah. things open and get it at the look at their raw files. But uh, yeah, but it, it was much ado about nothing because they had the pictures. <laughs> pictures <laughs> worth a thousand words. <laughs> How did that come to light? Do you remember? I mean, that was there. Were there like sources out there that uh, that explained? Well, that? you know, the first 
I heard about it was in the 70s, 1970s, when my friend Cy Hirsch wrote a four-part thing on, on Korshak for the New York Times. This was yeah. the first bit. You, you should look it up if you haven't read it. It was really breakthrough stuff reporting. This He and his partner, Jeff Gerth, spent maybe a year working on it. It was a big project. And they interviewed dozens, if not hundreds of people, a lot of trips to Chicago. And they got that story originally about the bribery of okay. Tepover. And I took it another step further when I got my sources. But they broke that. And, you know, it's a great series of articles. You should check it out. Yeah, yeah I will. I've, I, I've heard it. I know Seymour Hersh. He's pretty well respected. I mean, that guy broke a lot oh, of big yeah. stories. <laughs> He's yeah, he knows what he's uh, doing. Ended the Vietnam War in some ways. He really <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, he. I can tell you a side story that isn't well known about that. You know, he was trying to get Korshak for an interview for that. I know Cy, and he told me this story, and and Korshak would never respond, and and so ultimately they wrote the they published the first installment in the New York Times, and then if I remember, Cy got Cy Hirsch got a call from Korshak one day. And uh, Korshak was kind of soft-spoken, but very threatening. And it went along the lines of, now keep in mind, Sai had just done the My Lai Massacre, mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize-winning reporting. And so Korshak calls him up and says, uh, Mr. Hirsch, why are you doing this to me? And I don't know what Sai said, but he said, uh, shouldn't you be sticking with the, th the things you're good at, like blood? <laughs> think about blood, Mr. Mr. Hirsch. I want you to think about blood. That's what yeah. you're good at. And he kept saying it. And he and Cy said, man, a chill went through because he knew what he was talking about. <laughs> you know, it was just, so and then he hung up. But uh he said, Yeah, think about that, Mr. Hirsch. And they went forward though, and they published the other articles. Yeah. But yeah. uh those mob guys and then love, there was, they love those indirect yeah. threats that you yeah. can take, you know, that you can't really take. You know, oh, I had a threat. you know, I gotta tell you, I hate to if we're stuck for time, let me know. I'll tell you a great story like that. When I was working in Chicago interviewing, I interviewed a lot of the wise guys and their families and the law enforcement, everybody. And one of the uh, top bodyguards for Sam Giancana was still alive. And he became friendly with me. He, he, he thought I was going to be fair to the to the gang and tell the, sto the whole story. And, yeah. and so he was always calling to see if I was OK. He would call me at the hotels. Mm -hmm. He would call me here in Maryland. Are everything okay, Gus? Anybody bothering you? Should I talk to anybody for you? <laughs> you need anything? And it was the same thing. Well, there was speaking, I, I'm getting to the point of the veiled threat. Yeah. Yeah. So when he 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 called up, or no, Antoinette Giancana called me up one day and she said, How are things? I said, Things are real good. And then in passing, I said something about my publisher from one of my books hasn't been sending out his royalty statements and I really could use the money. And she said, Oh, that's too bad. So she hung up. Ten minutes later, this guy calls me up, this uh, bodyguard, and said, hey, Gus, I hear you're having problems with uh, uh, your publisher. <laughs> he said, he said uh, I've already checked. I can be in I can be in Baltimore at 930 tomorrow morning. You'll have your money by 10. How much does he owe you? I said, Louis. I said, Louis, Uncle Louis. Uncle Louis, please. No, I don't need this. He said, no, Gus, no problem. I said, and this really is, I think, insightful. I said to him, Louis, I don't need anybody coming here and threatening anybody. You know, he said, who do you think we are? We don't threaten. He said, he said I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'll just look him in the eye with a look he's never seen before and say, please pay my friend and he will pay you. I guarantee. And there'll be no guns, no yeah. threats, nothing. And yeah. it goes back to the old thing of the evil eye that these yeah. guys practice since they were kids. Uh, Malochia, Malochia, the Italians Malochia, call it. Yeah. Malochia, and he said, no, who do you think we are? I'll just look him in the eye and very nicely ask him for the money <laughs> I, i've got a friend today this guy of a reform mob associate and and he asked me to call his sister about doing a he wanted me to do a little favor i i don't practice anymore but i'm a lawyer so i called her up to see what the deal was and we were talking and i said well you know she said well i appreciate you know steve asking you to call me and i you know tried to help her out as best i could and she said, you know, she says, I have to be careful about what kind of favors I ask him to do. I said, yeah, I understand that. <laughs> Anything I ask him to do, too. Well, that's the thing. When, when they like you, you're sort of in the group. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and he never asked for a nickel. It wasn't about money. It's about like a blood oath or something. And literally, when I would arrive in Chicago, there'd be a note at the desk from Uncle Louie saying, Gus, everything taken care of? Anybody bother you? The same four questions. Do you need girls? Do you need some liquor? No, Louie, I'm fine. No. Speaking of Giancana, now, 
Chicago has this interesting setup how, you know, Rika kind of in the background and a Cardo's more yeah. up front then a Cardo kind of drops back and, and Giancana is like the boss, you know, everybody to everybody on the streets, there's Giancana. So how did Giancana did relate with our friend Llewellyn <laughs> Humphrey? Uh, I, I think, well, I mean, that's a good question. I, I think that he was a bit jealous of, I don't think Sam was all that bright. And he, he was a tough guy. He got there just by being tough, you know. And I think he, there was some resentment towards people like Korshak and, and Humphreys. And then they weren't Italian, obviously. Yeah. And and there was and, and the other thing was Humphreys and Korshak and Accardo all looked down on G uh, headline making stuff, going out with all the movie stars, Phyllis McGuire and everything. And there was always that tension there between Sam and on the front pages and people like uh you know, who were, who were way below the radar. So yeah. that, that was always a thing with them. So who would Humphreys deal with the most when it came to the Italian segment of the outfit as a boss that he, I mean, he didn't, it seemed like he didn't really report to anybody when like a capo or a captain or have a crew or anything. Right. It doesn't seem like how, how was his relationship and who was it with mostly? Well, according to his widow who knew a lot, Gene Humphreys, who I was like, lucky to find, and it was direct. They called him Joe, Joe Batters. They didn't, nobody ever called him Tony Accardo. Yeah. It was Joe. And, and, and it was a very, very tight relationship between Curly and, and, and Joe Batters, okay. Joe, Joe Accardo. And it's funny when I first started talking to her, I, I was asking her questions about Tony and, and for a minute, she didn't know what I, Oh, you mean Joe? And I said, Oh, that, that explained to me that they, everybody called him Joe. Yeah. And, 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 but yeah, Humphreys answered directly. It was Korshak answering to Humphreys and Humphreys answering to Accardo was pretty uh, much the as best I can tell. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. They like that uh, chain of command, if you will. They really like that chain of command, which of course keeps them from being directly involved with, with certain things that other people do. When you got that. Cut yeah. Out yeah. The huh. That's interesting. You know, another thing I read something about was the, the tailor shop with the FBI hidden mic. And how did he deal? Did he have to deal with Bill Romer or how was his relationship with the Bureau back in those days, in the early days of, you know, after 57, after they formed the top hoodlum squad? Then right. How did he deal with them? I know they had that hidden microphone in that tailor shop for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was, it was kind of a cat and mouse game and it's strange. Humphreys sort of liked the the challenge of dealing with it, and 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 Romer, you know, same thing. These guys, there was a there was a grudging respect if you read Romer's books, especially between you know Romer and and Humphreys, and Humphreys knew from the get go because they had a they actually had an FBI guy on the take, and they knew where the microphones were for the most part. There were a couple they didn't know, but they knew about the one in Solano's tailor shop, mm -hmm. and you know they're. In the transcripts, you see where Murray would come in at nine in the morning some days and for a meeting, and he would lean towards the microphone, which was hidden in a radiator, and he'd say, I'd like to welcome everybody to the nine o'clock meeting of the Chicago Organized Crime Gang, <laughs> knowing that these guys were going to laugh down the street, right? And a uh, percent of the time, if you look at organized crime uh, transcripts, they aren't really talking about crime most of the time. They're talking about their diets, you're putting on a few pounds. <laughs> yeah, how's the house? What's what's the what's the food like at Attica? You know, and and you, and I know that, that that chorus girl you're going around with. You better be careful. Your wife's going to find out. That was most of it. And these poor FBI guys had to type all this meaningless stuff up every night. <laughs> and but yeah, they 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 knew a lot of that where a lot of the microphones were. And do you remember the story when? Romer and those guys planted the microphone in Solano's. Do you remember what, what happened I, there? You the, know, I don't know that story. It's a funny story, but, but it was illegal. You know, right. Hooper told these guys to do it, but they said, if you get caught, we can't yeah. do anything. This yeah. is, these are illegal we, we bugs. We had one here right. in Kansas City where Nick Savella met. I saw oh, the transcript. there you go. They were illegal then, yeah, still. Yeah. yeah. And, and so they would sneak in. Now, Solano's was on the second floor on Michigan Avenue of a townhouse <laughs> or a shop. The lower floor was a restaurant. So they had to go in on a night, the FBI did, when the restaurant was closed. And I guess they went in on a Sunday night or something. And they they got up to the uh, second floor where the tailor shop was. And they put the they were going to put the first microphone in the floorboards between the restaurant ceiling or roof or whatever and the floor of the tailor shop. Well, 
they fell through the roof, the oh. ceiling, <laughs> into the restaurant below. And Romer, Romer said they spent the rest of the night driving around Illinois trying to find a place where they could buy plaster and paint and fix this thing before the <laughs> restaurant opened. And he said it was like a Keystone Cops. And then there was, you know, they would tail these guys. And they, Murray Humphreys had the, the story of he was being followed in a car by the FBI guys. And it was obvious. He knew. And and he was just going to pick up groceries or going to you know, go to them to a hardware store, whatever. It wasn't mob stuff most of the time. Yeah. But they were being followed. So he had his, he had a driver. So Murray had his driver pull over. And then the FBI, of course, pulls over behind him and Murray walks back to the FBI car and says, hey, guys, you know, it's getting kind of silly. We're wasting gasoline here. Why don't I send my driver home? I'll get in the car with you and I'll tell you where I need to go. <laughs> yeah, you can save gas. <laughs> yeah. Supposedly, at least on that day, they laughed and they did it. <laughs> they took him to the hardware store. <laughs> so there was this kind of love-hate thing going on. You know, <laughs> They were hired to bring this thing down, but they had to respect it. The, the smarts of you know, people they, like Humphrey. You know, he was, was he only charged with income tax evasion? Of course, they get everybody for that that they can't get for something else. That, what other kind of charges did they, did anybody ever get? Well, him? I mean, they were, when he died, they were after him for uh, not showing up for a grand jury or, or something. Uh, yeah. And, and, but, but essentially it was taxes. Sure. It was what they used to call ill gotten gains. You know, they, he had a house down in Key, Key Biscayne where his wife mostly lived, Jean. And uh, the FBI was in, is prowling around down there. How does he afford a beachfront house in Key Biscayne? And it got to be a real issue with with his wife. And she would call up Murray and say, hey, and she called him M. Hey, M, why are these guys following me all of a sudden? These FBI guys, they're everywhere. They're not they're, they're... And so that was it. It was the ill-gotten gains yeah. thing that really got him in trouble, I think. Spending more money that you show income. You know, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. That was always house. the problem. You know, that was, in fact, there were stories of uh, mob wives in Chicago complaining. I think Giancana's wife early on, she died young years earlier, but before she had passed, she was complaining that they had all this money. And she'd say, why don't you ever take me to Europe on a vacation? And he <laughs> said, I can't because they'll know we got the money. Well, then what good's the money? So it drove the wives crazy. Uh, they were burying money. They were hiding money in the walls of their houses, burying it in their backyards. Yeah. And the, a friend told me that after his pass, after Ricardo's passing, his wife, his widow, Clarice, showed up at Marshall's department store or something to buy a silver set, trays. And, and tea and everything and she pulled out all these twenty dollar bills yeah. and they were from like the 20s they were all moldy and it was clear they had been buried in the backyard and she finally got access to them so, so your yeah, money was always a problem what the, the, you know, be careful what you wish for <laughs> yeah really i think a lot of those guys was more about the game and the power and the lifestyle yeah probably than it was about the money the money's just kind of the nice little reward that you get, but they like the power. It was about fighting. Phyllis McGuire and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, you need it, if you get somebody a job or you get somebody a, yeah. you know, get their court case fixed or take care of their traffic tickets or that kind of power. That's yeah. one thing that the unions were so good for. I know in Kansas City, like Nick Savella and some of these underlings, you know, if so you went to them or knew them or related, you wanted a job, they got you a job on the dock down there in the, in, you know, in the Teamsters Union. They got you a job at least on the dock right away. So it's well, Mary Humphrey's daughter Luella, she spent her last years going back and forth to Switzerland to try to find his Swiss bank account because right. it was it was well known he had it, and that that will probably never be found. But there's money all around that'll never be found in yeah. backyards in Switzerland, and she thought she had the number of, of the of the of the safe deposit box but she didn't and so yeah they just couldn't spend the money it was really a, a weird thing so what would be i guess kind of as we're getting down to the end here what would be one more a good story about oh gee let me think well you know i always think of it and it's in the book they went when they became so powerful in hollywood the, you know, they became friendly with all the movie stars and all the singers and they all knew these guys even though the public never knew who murray humphreys was yeah and and there's a photo you may have seen in the in the photo spread of the outfit, and again where a picture says a thousand words about power. Uh, Luella in, in the early '50s wasn't getting didn't have a date for the prom, and she was complaining to her father, "Oh, Daddy, I'm not going to be able to go to the to the senior dance or whatever." And she said, "He says, well, 
you want a date? I'll get you a date. I'll get somebody to take you. Who do you want? And she said, Frank Sinatra. Murray Got picks it. up the phone. So, and, there, and there's Sinatra. There's a photo that the family gave me of Sinatra at her prom. It's in the photo spread. So and this was at the height of Sinatra. You know, he flies to Chicago to take this 16 year old to her dance. That's power. And, and so that's power. That That's, a, that's a, just a great story. You know, after we cut off, I'll probably think of a hundred more, but yeah. they're sort of everywhere. You know, these guys, gee, at the time that Phyllis McGuire, well, probably, let me tell you, I, you probably don't have time, but the best, one of the best stories takes a little bit of a setup. Oh, but we got time. Go ahead. Let's you got time? This this is, yeah, we got time. Okay, good. I became very close with Jean Humphreys, and she was a wonderful source of information. She kept a 400-page journal of her life with Murray, and it's priceless because she's a, she was a good writer, and she was in the middle of a lot of it. She wasn't like home cooking. She was a gangster herself. She was a wannabe. So she forced Murray to tell her everything. Okay, so when the feds are cracking down on her in Key Biscayne, following her around and going to the house, uh, she calls up Murray and complains, why is Hoover doing this? We, we, he never bothered us all these years. Why is it? Why is this happening? And, and Murray said, I can't tell you, Blondie. And she argues with him. All right, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, we had him under control for a while. We, we knew some things. What did you know? What did you have? Said, I can't tell you, Blondie. And she would always pester him. And it was a kind of a funny Lucy Desi relationship. And, <laughs> really? and eventually she would always get it out of him. Oh, we had a photograph for a long time. And and what kind of photo? I can't tell you. Tell me or I'll do this. So he, he said, okay, well, when remember we used to go over to May Capone's house, uh, Al Capone's house on, on Palm Island in Florida and deliver their money to them. That's one of the things they did. Al Hoover was going down there around Christmas with his boyfriend across the waterway. They rented a house for with uh, Clyde Tolson or whomever. And, and so Hoover brought all these guys with uh, telescopes to focus on Capone's house across the water. And they and Capone got so pissed, he got his guys down there and got his guys to get telescopes looking back across at the house. And he said, and Humphrey said to Gene, one day he left his drapes open. Yeah, and, and what? Well, we saw he was having sex. And, and <laughs> Gene, said, Gene said, well, it's no big deal. Everybody has sex. She said, yeah, but it was, he said, yeah, but it was with a guy. And so they had that photo. That's, and they, so they did a fo- telephoto thing. They got a photo of it. And allegedly, this is according to Gene, who never lied to me, yeah. this is how they controlled Hoover. And uh, so Gene said, well, what's changed? Why is he after us all of a sudden? She said, well, that stupid Giancana, he gave a copy of it to Sinatra. He gave it to Bobby Kennedy. Now Bobby's <laughs> blackmailing him. So that's her version that's of why the one. feds cracked down in the late 50s. <laughs> <laughs> that stupid Giancana. That's a good one. All right. Well, Gus Russo, I really appreciate you coming on. Those have been some great stories, and, and that'll tantalize people to want to get some of your Chicago Outfit books, particularly The Outfit and Super Mob and and the titles that, you know, come off the top of my head for sure. And you got a lot more and I'll have links to it, guys. So I really appreciate you coming on and and telling these stories, guys. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Gary. My pleasure. All right. Well, guys, you know, I like to ride motorcycles. So watch out for motorcycles when you're out there. And don't forget, if you have a problem with PTSD and you've been in the service, go to the VA website and get that hotline number. And drug and alcohol addiction usually goes hand in hand with PTSD. So, you know, former Gambino soldier, Anthony Ruggiano works in a treatment center down in Florida. He has a hotline on his website. So if you want to partake of his services, why, you know, give him a shout. Give me a call if you ever do that. I'd be interested to know how that went for you. And don't forget to like and subscribe or give us a review on uh, the podcast, the apps, the audio apps, and keep coming back. We'll put a story out every week. And and Gus, uh, I really appreciate These have been some great stories. I've been wanting to get you on for a long time. So thanks. Oh, my pleasure. I'll do it anytime you need me. Yeah, my my pleasure, Gary. A lot of fun.